Hello everybody, I'm Gwen Campbell Mendes. Welcome to Gwen's Bookish Ramblings. And so we're on the last of the Enchanted Forest Chronicles books, the last one that Patricia Reedy wrote, um, other than one appearance in a collection of short stories, which um, I'll get to that at some point when I get to it, but uh, I just didn't particularly feel like going to the effort of... Um, going to the effort of lugging along that many extra books. I I have, you know, I brought a tablet so I could download books, and I brought the one, four books in one volume. I didn't want to keep track of anything else. Anyways, so, this is also my last day of vacation. Um, no, I have not recorded these all on consecutive days. Um, but anyhow... So we're on the last book of the Enchanted Forest Chronicles, Calling on Dragons, another book that I did not own as it is here. So Calling on Dragons, um, like the other three books that in theory come before uh, that in theory come before talking to dragons, um, is is uh, summarized in the case of the... Uh, it, it is summarized at the end of Talking to Dragons. And uh, so that summary, which is, of course, the last section of, of the rapid-fire explanation of how Daystar came to be chucked into the Enchanted Forest with nothing but a magical sword and his wits, such as they are, is... The wizards didn't make any trouble for almost a year, but when they finally did, they made up for the wait. They stole Father's sword right out of the castle armory. They'd figured out that the sword was the main thing keeping them from absorbing magic in the enchanted forest, Father said, and they thought that if they got rid of it, they could soak up the whole forest and use all that extra magic to wipe out the dragons. They didn't realize at first that even without the sword, I could use the magic of the forest against them. Well, what good was the stupid sword anyway, Shiara asked. If you didn't need it to stop the wizards, I did need it, Father said. I can deal with one or two wizards at a time, but not the whole society of wizards at once. And I can't be everywhere. The sword is connected directly to the magic of the enchanted forest, so it protects the whole forest and not just the area where it happens to be. If you want the technical details, ask Telamine. He helped me set it up. With the sword gone, Father had to stay in the Enchanted Forest to keep the wizards out. Kazul and Morwen and Telamane all volunteered to go steal the sword back, Only, but there was a problem. When the sword is outside the Enchanted Forest, only the King of the Enchanted Forest, or a member of his family, can stand to hold it for more than a few seconds. And Mother was the only other member of Father's family then. Father wasn't too pleased about this because Mother was going to have a baby, me, but they didn't really have any other choice. So Mother and the rest left to find the sword, and Father stayed in the Enchanted Forest to fight off the wizards. They didn't expect the whole society of wizards to attack the castle the day after they left, but that's what happened. Fortunately, Mother had a feeling something was wrong, and she sent Kazool back to check. When Kazool saw all the wizards attacking the castle, she flew back to the Mountains of Mourning and ordered all the dragons to come help. Meanwhile, Mother and the others found the sword with Antorel guarding it. He was the son of Zeminar, the head wizard of the Society of Wizards, and Mother didn't like him much. So when he tried to keep them from taking the sword back, Mother melted him. Unfortunately, by the time they got back to the castle, the battle was over and the wizards had put their shield up. Kazul sent some dragons out to look for wizards who had gotten away, and then she and Mother and Morwen and Telamane had a long talk about what to do next. And that's where this book ends. They have a long talk about what to do next, decide that the only option they have is to wait until Daystar is old enough to use the sword to free Mendenbar. And so... This book ends with everyone settling in to wait. They're just going to wait for the next 16 years. <clears throat> so, why is this book my favorite of the series? Well, uh, in a word, cats. You see, the primary, uh, the lead character in this series is the witch Morwen. Now, we first met Morwen... Um, in talking to dragons because, you know, she showed up along the way to help Daystar, heal Daystar's arm, showed up at the final battle, got engaged to Telemane, God only knows why. She shows up in dealing with dragons as the witch that Kazul has been borrowing uh, crepe pans from and uh, 
also is the one who provides a particular book that contains information that is effectively the solution to how the wizards were uh, affecting Colin Stone to make Warog win. And she shows up in uh, Searching for Dragons at the beginning of the book when uh, Mendenbar is given directions to ask a witch Morwen about the burned out section of the forest and then shows up at the end in order to sort of keep things moving, in effect. Well, this book is her perspective, and... Her perspective involves the fact that she has nine cats and can talk to all of them, as in have conversations. The cats are just as intelligent as people, perhaps more so in several cases. And so the fun, one of the very fun things in this book is these conversations that she has with her cats, with Murgatroyd, Fiddlesticks, Miss Eliza, Tudor, Scorn, Jasmine, Trouble, Jasper, Darlington, Higgins IV, Chaos, and Antiphilia. And the, the feline perspective on the world, the way that, uh, and the way that she converses with them, the fact, the way that cats are useful, um, and I, I just enjoy the cat's perspective. I also, of course, enjoy very fundamentally Killer, the rabbit who, um, yes, is a rabbit named Killer, um, who in the course of this book first gets, uh, winds up growing to being, uh, increasing in size to 7 feet 11 inches, including the ears. He always knows how tall he is. Then turns into a splotchy donkey. Then he turns into a blue donkey. Then he turns into a floating blue donkey. And then he grows wings and is a floating blue donkey with wings. A 6 foot 11 inch, a 7 foot 11 inches uh, floating blue donkey with wings. Um, and... It's one of the central concepts in this book, one of the central genuinely ridiculous things that um, come across, that happen in this book. Also key in this book is the Arona Michaelier Grenogian Vamist, who is a weird sort of traditionalist who feels that Witches are not proper witches unless they're walking, unless they're dressed all in black and have humpbacks and are constantly cackling and only have one black cat. A person who has nine cats that are not black is not a proper witch and thus foredoomed to failure. Um, and so this book opens with Morwen talking to her cats, Morwen discussing Arona Michaelia Grenogi and Vamist, a visit from the, uh, from the chair witch Arcanis, um, and her cat. And not long after that, in chapter two, she meets Killer the Rabbit, and from there... That's where things spiral rapidly out of control. It is also, this is also the book where we discover uh, how Cimmerine was able to, in talking to dragons, melt a wizard by pointing at him and saying, Argelfraster. That is apparently thoroughly Telemain's fault, because while, yes, you can melt a wizard in a bucket of soapy water with a little lemon, it is tremendously inconvenient to haul around a bucket of soapy water with a little lemon, so... Um, and, uh, so figuring out how to melt wizards without doing that was a particular project of Telemain's, and he decided the trigger word had to be Argelfraster because it was memorable, which, as they say in the book, you have to give it to him, it is memorable. And after several chapters, of course, they find out that the sword has gone missing, which is why wizards have started being able to take magic out of the Enchanted Forest again. 
They have their argument with Mendenbar, and, of course, they set off on their quest to find the sword. And they have various misadventures along the way, um, including... I had mentioned before that there's always a great deal of fun in playing, uh, in playing the game Spot the Fairy Tale, but the fact of the matter is that in this, in uh, Calling on Dragons, there is reference to, well, there's reference to the Wizard of Oz in Searching for Dragons when they get to talking about ruby, talking about ruby slippers and the matching belt. Um, the matching belt is, in fact, a um, Oz series specific thing, um, but it's not something you would run into in The Wizard of Oz, the book, which, by the way, she has silver slippers in that and not ruby, and we all know, if we have any sense at all, that the reason that uh, Judy Garland Dorothy has ruby slippers has to do with the fact that ruby slippers show up way better in uh, Technicolor than silver slippers would. But uh, in, I believe it is Return to Oz, I haven't looked it up recently, um, there's a thing with, a, uh, with the King of the Gnomes, and he has a magic belt, and it winds up in the hands of Ozma, who is now the Queen of Oz. There's a whole thing. I was, I'm going to be doing the Oz series at some point, and we'll go into it then. Anyways, but there's also references to Alice in Wonderland when Killer the Rabbit mentions that his uncle, that he's late for something. He must be late for something because he had an uncle who's always late for something. You know, late for a very important date, no time to say hello, goodbye, he's late, he's late, he's late. Um, in any event, so they make their way through various adventures and misadventures and meet Farmer MacDonald who, uh, yes, Farmer MacDonald, who is attempting to raise various uh, magical crops and uh, farm animals. Uh, you know, little things like, uh, you know, geese that lay golden eggs, little dogs that laugh. Um, and, of course, the... Uh, and, uh, let's see, um, where was it? As always, I, I don't, uh, I, I don't prepare extra large, it, here it is, uh, there's straw, first quality for spinning to gold, I can deliver as much as you want on a regular schedule, I grow four kinds of grain, oats, barley, millet, and wheat on the same plant, so it's harvested pre-mixed, I sell it by the bushel to people who want to test someone by making them sort out the different kinds, and beans, naturally. I got the kind that jump and the kind that grow giant stalks. I've got apples, poisoned or gold, and several varieties, extra large pumpkins for turning into coaches, and walnuts with anything you want inside, from a miniature dog to a dress as shining as the stars. Um, and so on. So, Old MacDonald has a farm, and, uh... They eventually meet Brandel the Fire Witch after Telemaine suffers from the opposite of backshock. That is, backshock in these books is defined as when you overstress a spell and the spell breaks, snapping back up on the caster, causing various forms of physical distress. In this case, when Telemaine was trying to transport, his spell got sucked up by wizards. Are we surprised? No, we're not. Um, and they wind up in the Smoking Swamp, where they meet Brandel the Fire Witch, who helps them retrieve the sword. And at that point, they wind up making their way back to the Enchanted Forest, only to discover that, well, it's too late, and all that they've been able to do is get the wizards out, because Mendenbar is, of course, trapped in some sort of alternate dimension hole in the universe transport spell gone looped and weird um also arona michaelia grenoji and vamist gets changed into a seven feet 11 inches floating blue donkey with wings um which is done partly to punish him and partly because of course nobody will listen to anyone who looks that ridiculous killer gets to go back to being a rabbit poor thing um, thank goodness for poor killer, and everybody lives, uh, ever after until, of course, talking to dragons kicks in. 
and I'll see you all next week.